it is incredibly difficult not to sing. I, I feel for you, and uh, I hope you appreciate, you know, I understand where you're coming from. And it's also incredibly frustrating because we were at the soccer last night and it doesn't seem like any such prohibition exists if you're uh, at the soccer. So, uh, yes, just you know, sharing and venting my frustration. Uh, it has nothing to do with the message. We're going to talk today... Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, it's a nice way to start, isn't it? Uh, we're going to talk today about lust and adultery. If there are any children still here present, I would like to recommend that you uh, send them to Kids Church upstairs. And if you are watching at home and you have children in the room, you may wish to press pause and come back to this one a little bit later because, well, Jesus has some things to say. I'm not, I'm not going to be obscene and I'm not going to be vulgar or anything like that, but uh, it may raise some questions you're not quite prepared to answer. So there we go, that's the disclaimer at the beginning today. Now, if you are over, say, the age of 12 or 13, uh, you might like to take out your notebooks because it's going to be interesting. There's a little bit of a chuckles going on out there, it's good, it's a good start. How many of you, when you were growing up, had the sex talk with your parents? No one's going to put their hands up, right? Because we asked a question about sex in church and no one's going to admit to knowing anything about sex in church, are they? Bradley's not sure if he did or not, but we'll sort that out. <laughs> How many of you are parents and now have, and have had to be the ones giving the lecture? How many of you or parents talked about birds and bees? Because if you did, I'd love to hear what that's about because I have no idea what birds and bees have to do with anything. When I was a kid, uh, I was in year five or year six, I can't remember what year it was, and every kid in our year was, in, was invited or had to come up to the school with their parents one afternoon, one evening, where we watched a video, an incredibly badly produced video, but it was good enough that it explained the mechanics of things and the anatomy of certain things, and I was horrified and a little bit disgusted, but uh, that was the way it was. How many of you had that kind of experience, going to the school? Did anyone do that in your school? Was that a public, public school thing? Yeah. It was. Does everyone, will have a support group after this and recover from the trauma of that? It was horrific, wasn't it? I, I then went from a public school to a Christian high school where sex education would be summed up in one word, don't. Just don't. It's dirty, it's terrible, it's bad, it's horrible. Anyone had that kind of lecture? Maybe from church or from Christian schools and, and so on. I, I don't know how anyone expected churches to grow, but that was the way it was taught. But of course, in our society, sex education doesn't stop there. Probably doesn't even begin there. Whispered stories in the playground, between peers, television, movies and the web have far more influence on how we understand sex and particularly how we understand sex in the context of relationships than we ever had from our teachers and parents. From TV, movies and internet today we find that our culture presents a very shallow view of intimacy in relationships. Maybe you've seen or heard some of these kinds of attitudes come through our media sources. Oh, as long as you're committed to each other for at least a night, so long as you use protection, as long as you're both consenting adults, I mean that's important, but as long as no one gets hurt, we are a long way from the Puritanism of the Victorian era. We're even a long way, miles away, from where our parents and grandparents, the way they viewed sex in relationships, aren't we? It's not hard today to find images and scenes on television and in movies that would have been considered shameful and obscene just 
a generation ago. In fact, we've got billboards out on the street that would be considered shameful and obscene. The most popular websites in Australia, you can probably hear where this is going, right? The most popular websites in Australia were, last year, uh, Google, although that might change thanks to the news thing, but anyway, Google, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, eBay, Microsoft, and then a porn site. Porn was more visited in this country than Wikipedia, News.com, the ABC, and even more than Netflix. Does that come as a surprise? In fact, there are two porn sites that ranked higher than Netflix. And before you begin to assume that these are all guys sitting in their grandparents' basements, let me point out that recent studies show that 30 to 50% of all porn site visitors are women, and that number is growing. Porn has become such a normalized feature of our society. I don't know whether you realize this. It used to be that if you read anything about pornography, it was always spoken of in hushed and shameful, negative tones. Not anymore. You're more likely to find negative reports about alcohol use than you are pornography. Well, one thing is for sure. Sex is a bigger deal today in our culture than it has been for over a thousand years. I wouldn't necessarily say it's more a part of our culture than it was for the ancient Greeks and Romans. That's interesting, isn't it? The evidence we have from the first century, the images, sculptures, writings, wall hangings, all show that the ancient Romans were just as lust-obsessed as we are. Well, we are going to have a look in a little bit more detail at what Jesus had to say to them and to us. In the Sermon on the Mount, we are going to look at the alternate way that Jesus spoke of love, sex, relationships and marriage. So, if you have a Bible and would like to turn with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 to 32. Like last week, Jesus begins, if you're in the NIV, Jesus begins with a point that everyone is familiar with. You have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. Now, I will admit that this verse, when I was growing up, confused me a little bit, because I thought it had to do with not becoming an adult. And I was, uh, well, surprised to learn that it had something other in mind. And I'm glad Jesus is happy for us to become adults. Well, I will then use the message translation, because I think uh, it made more sense. You know the next commandment pretty well. Don't go to bed with another spouse. But don't think you've preserved your virtue simply by staying out of bed. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. Those leering looks you think nobody notices, they also corrupt. Sometimes I think, uh, sometimes, sometimes I think we think that the Bible says, don't sleep with anyone who's married because you'll damage their relationship. Almost we think as though Jesus' only concern is about preserving marriage. Well, it's true, Jesus is all about protecting marriage and with good reason that we'll look at a little bit later on, but He goes further. Look at what He actually says. Your heart can be corrupted by lust even quicker than your body. That lust, those leering looks, yes, even the ones that nobody notices, the ones that are completely internal to you, that lust, those leering looks, they corrupt you, they do something to your internal world that causes you damage. Doesn't matter if the person you're looking at knows you're looking at them or not. Doesn't matter if the person you're looking at is married or not, it doesn't matter whether you're married or not, lustful looks corrupt. There are millions of articles written out there, I just grabbed one from Psychology Today and I have this quick quote for you from Grant Hillary Brenner, despite growing acceptance, there is serious concern that pornography causes real harm. 
exploitation and risk to performers, damage to the capacity for healthy relationship and interfering with relationship and sexual satisfaction, addictive potential, illegal activity, supporting human trafficking and child abuse, and contribution to the general societal trend to objectify and present unrealistic expectations for physical attributes, as well as what healthy sexual behavior is. Modern psychology seems to agree with Jesus, which is good, I think. Your heart can be corrupted by lust quicker than your body. And Jesus then suggests we should do something about it. This is the, this is the, the heavy part, right? Isn't it? Let's not pretend this is easier than it really is. If you really want to live a pure life, here's what you have to do. You have to blind your right eye the moment, it catch, you, the moment you catch it in a lustful leer. You have to choose to live one-eyed or else you'll be dumped on the moral trash pile. That's heavy. Jesus is not mucking around. He says the damage is serious. The risk is incredible. The risk is so high that you should gouge out your eye or chop off your hand to avoid it. How many of you have wandered through your house in the middle of the night, pitch black in the darkness, and stubbed your toe on a piece of furniture? Anybody? There's a few nods, I need some hands, I need to feel like I'm not alone. Oh, great. Uh, how many of you, how many of you have then kicked that piece of furniture, causing yourself even more harm? Oh, that's just me. All right. You're probably not going to do it more than once, right? You would think. But the next night, you'll probably make sure that piece of furniture isn't in the way, or you'll turn the light on, or you'll throw the coffee table out the door. We don't have a coffee table in my house, just saying. You do something to make sure you don't hurt yourself again. That's what Jesus is saying. Do something. Make sure you don't hurt yourself again. I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity, I guess is a word, but doesn't quite work. If you've ever sat with someone who's made this kind of mistake in their life, whether they've found themselves in an affair or, or with a porn addiction or with anything like that. I don't know whether you've ever sat with someone in the middle of that pain and trauma and you've heard them say something like, I would give my right arm to be able to go back and undo what I did. The pain is incredible. The risk is high. Do whatever it takes to avoid it, says Jesus. Protect your relationships, protect yourself. Well, Jesus continues his sermon. Verse 31, remember the scripture that says, whoever divorces his wife, let him do it legally, giving her divorce papers and her legal rights. Do you remember that? Remember that? Well, too many of you are using it as a cover for selfishness and whim, pretending to be righteous because you are legal. Please, no more pretending if you divorce your wife, you are responsible for making her an adulteress, unless she's already made herself that by sexual promiscuity. And if you marry such a divorced adulteress, you're automatically an adulterer yourself. You can't use legal cover to mask a moral failure. That's pretty heavy, isn't it? Particularly for those who've suffered through a divorce. So, we need to get some context. Jesus is talking to a society where people would divorce people on a whim. It used to be quite easy back in the ancient days, a thousand years or so before Jesus, when a husband could simply say, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you, and a wife would be out. And then they could be free to marry someone else and have sex again with someone different. Now, 
they have to at least sign a bit of paper. So they do that, and it's dead easy. So if the wife wants to divorce her husband, she can just tell him what she wants, and he'll divorce her. And he can divorce her, they just fill out a bit of paper, it's all done. And they're free to go get married and have sex with other people. And that's what was happening. The men and women would convince themselves that divorcing and every other day, divorcing and remarrying every other day so they could sleep with whoever they wanted was legal and it was okay, it's fine, no worries. It's ridiculous. They could legally sleep around just like they thought they could legally leer and they could legally lust just so long as they stayed out of bed, wouldn't have any effect on them, no worries. It's all about sex. Sex that destroys relationships, sex that destroys love, sex that destroys respect. That's why Jesus says, if you do this, if you divorce on a whim for sex, then you're an adulterer. Doesn't matter when you sign the papers. They treated marriage and divorce as incredibly trivial, but marriage is not trivial. It's not something man-made and simple that you can change and muck around with. Human beings are relational, right? We are made to be in a relationship. The most basic form of relationship exists between two people. It's widely considered to be the minimum number of people required for a relationship. A marriage is the mostest relationship you can have. It is everything about a relationship to the nth degree. Way back at the beginning, God says it's not good for the human being to be alone. And a marriage is a place to be unalone to the greatest extent. To be close, connected and unalone emotionally, spiritually and of course then physically as the capstone And that's it. That's the purpose of marriage. It's not about having children. It's not about this or that or anything else. It is the purpose of marriage is to be the nth degree relationship. And it is a source of incredible power. There is a power of incredible dimensions in a marriage for good and for bad. It's so powerful that it's scary. And in fact, if you want to read a little bit more detail of what Jesus has to say about marriage and divorce, you can turn to Matthew chapter 19. And Jesus explains this in a little bit more detail. And the disciples say, well, whoever is going to get married? Who's going to do that? And Jesus says, no, no, no. People can get married. You'll be okay. But anyway, another story for another time. Marriage has a power that is scary. I don't know whether you stop and think about this. Marriage and relationships like it have the power to set the course of your life as a whole. If your marriage is weak, and yet everything else around you, in every other area of your life, you're surrounded by strength, work is going well, and all that sort of stuff, it doesn't matter. If your marriage is weak, you'll move out into the world in weakness. Conversely, if your marriage is strong, everything around you might go to pot. But you'll move out into the world in in strength because that relationship has a massive, massive, massive amount of power. Your spouse has power. If your spouse says you're ugly, just me, right? And everyone else around you says you're beautiful, you're going to feel like you're ugly, no matter what other people say. The relationship has that power. If your spouse says you're beautiful and everyone else says you're ugly, it doesn't matter, you'll feel beautiful because marriage has that power. Those are just two examples of an infinite number of examples. Marriage is significant, it has power, it needs to be protected and managed and worked on. But sometimes marriages don't work. Sometimes they do end. Sometimes we suffer separation and divorce. As I said, Matthew 19, Jesus is asked directly about divorce. And let me add a few more thoughts from there. We've all heard the phrase at a wedding, what God has joined together, let no man separate. 
And Jesus says, look, if you understand marriage as this deep unaloneness with incredible power and significance, then you just can't imagine divorce like taking off your jacket, signing a little bit of paper. It's like taking off your leg. You can't just divorce people trivially, says Jesus. Just so you can go marry and have sex with other people? Divorce is not a solution to lust. The emotional and psychological enmeshment that incurs in a relationship like marriage is like two trees planted side by side, and in time the roots do grow together. You can't separate one from the other without causing great harm to both, no matter which side of the table you sit on. So while Jesus affirms that divorce can be done, certificates can be drawn up, there is provision for that. It should never be done in a trivial manner or for trivial reasons. Imagine a doctor. He'd be stripped of his medical license and run out of town if he simply suggested an amputation for everything, right? Oh, you have shingles? Chop off your leg. Some of you who've had shingles would probably think that's a good solution. It's pretty painful, I hear. But it's a bit of a, well, I don't think a doctor would be, you know, accepted with that. Oh, you got stung by a bee? Chop off your hand. No worries. Divorce is the same. It's like that. It's an amputation. It causes great trauma and great damage. But then, the law did exist in Jesus' time. Jesus does affirm that it existed, and it exists in our time. There are many reasons as to why an amputation might be necessary. There are reasons as to why a divorce might be required. Diseases of the heart and the soul, many diseases of our society, Jesus describes it as a, a hardness of heart that exists among human beings. It's simply a result of broken human nature and a broken world. It should be done with great care because people will be hurt, people will be traumatized. But sometimes it's necessary. The final thing I want to say about divorce is to read Jeremiah 3, verse 8 from the NIV, which records God's reaction when Israel went searching for other gods instead of Him. He says, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all her adulteries. It doesn't matter if you are God of the universe. There is a brokenness in humanity that sometimes causes hurt, pain, relationship breakdown and divorce. So where do we end with Jesus' teaching? We end by acknowledging the relationships of great intimacy in our lives that are incredibly powerful, incredibly significant, and can sometimes go incredibly wrong. They should never be treated lightly. If you're single, be careful in your relationships. Be courageous with those who demonstrate that you can trust them, but be careful. Before you get into any sort of physical intimacy, make sure your emotional and spiritual connection is founded on a genuine pledge of commitment made in sober consideration in front of friends and witnesses. Basically, if you come across someone, you like someone, you're involved with someone and all that sort of stuff, but if they have a, a lack of understanding or empathy or respect in any single area of your life, if they lack that respect or empathy for any part of your life, you need to be very, very careful about what you do with that relationship. And if you do want to pursue things, make your relationship deeper and deeper, then make sure you go through some intense preparation work. Go through the major questions and issues of life before you open yourself up completely, emotionally, spiritually and physically. Be careful. And also, don't fall into the trap of swiping right and swiping left. The band knows what I'm talking about. 
using appearance, physical attraction as the primary foundation for a relationship. That's backwards. It doesn't matter how many six-packs he has or how big her eyes are. If you can't form genuine emotional, spiritual intimacy, it's going to fall over and end in tears. And you never know. If you swipe the wrong way on someone who could have been a truly incredible soulmate. If you're married, be careful in your relationship. Make sure you are supportive, open, accepting and loving in all your conversations. Be courageous with your love. Work on being open and sharing. Share things with your spouse that maybe you haven't shared before or maybe stopped talking about because they didn't seem interested about 10 years ago. Have a go. Talk. Don't use that old phrase, I told them I loved them on our wedding day and I'll let them know if I change my mind. Keep putting in the effort. Particularly... If your life circumstances are changing, when people come to talk to me about problems in marriage and and things like this, it's always about when things are changing, right? Having kids, sending kids to school, changing jobs, changing homes, kids leaving home, retiring, moving into assisted living, all these things change, require a lot of communication and sharing needs to take place. I'd even suggest a counsellor because they're great at helping you talk. Now, if you are everyone, this is where we're going to finish today before we pray. If you are everyone, anyone who can listen to me and hear me, do not treat yourself trivially. Understand the damage that leering looks can do to your soul, your life and all your relationships. Understand how lust reduces another person to as an object, a reduction that then psychologically begins to repeat in other relationships until you begin to see everyone more as an it than a true person. Make a commitment here today to remove anything and everything in your life that facilitates lust. Remove anything and everything in your, that, that draws your attention in that way. Talk about it with your, with your partner or figure it out with friends. Be mindful of the direction of your gaze, the focus of your desire. Take the time today. Make sure you aren't one of those who get to the point where you're saying, I wish I could have given my right arm to be able to go back and undo what I did. Let me pray as we finish this morning. Lord God, we come before you today. We thank you for your words to the people on the mountain. We thank you that you made us for relationship and we've had the opportunity today to consider what you said about adultery, lust, divorce and marriage. We confess that just like yours, our society has become obsessed with sex. We confess that in many ways our society has reduced intimacy to a purely physical expression and has often discarded emotional and spiritual intimacy that is required to make a whole relationship. We confess that we've fallen into the trap of looking, the lie of lusting or even the false promises of porn. We confess that we have treated people trivially. We've reduced them to objects. God, we ask today that you help us live according to your teaching. Help us to live in your alternate way, recognizing the significant danger in lustful looking. Give us the courage and ability to work on our relationships and may we see strength and harmony increase increase across our lives, relationships, families and our church, we pray. Amen. Amen.